Walter David Ehlers, United States Army, World War II. Walt served with the 18th Regiment, 1st Infantry Division in World War II and landed at Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944. He had an older brother named Roland who was four years older than him and both of them are from Kansas, farm boys from Kansas, decided to join the military in 1940. Um, Walt was underage and his mother would sign for him if Walt promised to be a good Christian soldier. And in Walt's own words, he didn't smoke or drink during his military service. Well, both boys fought in the North Africa campaign in Sicily and found themselves in England in 1944, marshalling area in England, getting ready to, for the D-Day invasion, the Normandy invasion. And they were both assigned to the 18th Regiment, 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, in Company K. Now, Walt left and went to Company L because they wanted to sp split the brothers apart because if something happened to one of them, one hopefully would survive. So on the morning of June 6, 1944, um, Roland was in an LCVP Higgins boat going to shore and their boat was struck by motor fire. Roland was killed in action and Walt didn't know about it until a month later in July and he was brought back to the United States in 1948 and he's buried in Kansas. So, And he is Walt's hero in Walt's own words. His brother's his hero and he thinks about him every day. Well, Walt went on after Normandy, landed on Omaha Beach and in, around June 9th he received a Congressional Medal of Honor for his actions that day, and it's too, too, new, too amazing to tell right now. You're gonna have to go read this citation yourself, but it's the heroic actions of Walt. It's just incredible. You're reading like Superman. I mean, these guys were American heroes. These were men that I consider men of the greatest generation, and Walt received the Medal of Honor for what he did and just lived to tell about it. What a wonderful man. He died in 2014, and he was the last D-Day survivor, a recipient of the Medal of Honor who had passed away at that time. Walt also received a silver star, two bronze stars, and several purple hearts for being wounded in action. Again, just an incredible story of a farm boy from Kansas made good. And it's just amazing that I can bring you these stories, folks. I interviewed Walt in Buena Park, California, almost 20 years ago, July 24th, 2004, at his home there with his wife. And I'm telling you what, it's one of the most amazing stories of D-Day that I have. I'd like to thank Alex Woolbrandt. Alex, thank you again for making this possible for others to hear Walt's story. Thank you for sponsoring this story, and thank you for your dedication to our veterans and our country. If you folks watching this are being stirred in your heart, and I know some of you are, to, to sponsor a story or to consider it, I, I, I ask that you would please consider doing that. That would help me get these stories out. I have numerous stories in my archives and you're making it possible for many others around the world to hear and to be touched by these stories. So folks, we know freedom's not free, freedom's earned, and it's through our men and women that have served and are serving today that we have our freedoms. And I thank God for it. I thank God for it and we can share this with our younger generations and our older generations. So there's information in the video description in the comment section of my videos. You can go to LarryCapetto.com, my website, and you can also donate from there and, and look at my work and some of the other things I've done. So I am happy, I am proud to bring to you a, an American hero, folks, a Medal of Honor recipient, Walter David Ehlers, here on the Voices of History channel. Please share this channel with others. Let's keep this thing going, folks. Share it with a loved one, another veteran. Invite them to watch this story. And like I said, let's keep this thing going. So God bless you for watching, and I'll talk to you soon. go back and uh, first talk about uh, Omaha Beach, your, your role in that, and mm -hmm. can you go back and remember like the night before the invasion, where you were, what you were doing, and just what your thoughts were that night, June the 5th? 
Um, you know, I, well, actually, uh, we went down to the beach. We went down, we were supposed to go out on the night of the 4th. So we were actually on the boats on the, on the 4th that we were going to go out on, and then they canceled it. And so we didn't leave until the night of the 5th, so we were on a boat all day. Uh, we were just <laughs> doing what most GIs do to occupy our time, reading or uh, if we got involved in games or shooting crap or something like that. We did that, and uh, the uh, the biggest uh, thing was that there were so many people around that uh, really there wasn't, you know, too much that we could think about. That, that just the awe of the immense amount of people involved in the ships that were lined up getting ready to go. Actually, uh, when we came from uh, Dorchester, where we were stationed, down to Weymouth, where we were going to embark from, um, we saw so many fields of vehicles. I mean, tanks and trucks and jeeps, brand new vehicles, never been used. And uh, all lined up there, field after field of them. And then when we got down to the, and artillery pieces and all that kind of stuff, and we got down to the uh, docks where we saw these warehouses and they were loaded with all kinds of, uh, of uh, stuff for the uh, invasion, all of the, the materials that were necessary to make an invasion successful, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just it was so much there that we just couldn't believe our eyes hardly. And then when you got onto the boats, why you could walk from one ship to the other without stepping in the water for about a mile down the beach. And it was just unbelievable that they had that much in there. And we kind of wondered, you know, about this uh, when we saw the fields and when we saw all the boats and everything, where the Germans were then, because uh, it, it looked like, a, to us, a big sight, you know, a big, uh, uh, a, a big target, because there was so much all together there in one spot. But they had a pretty, you know, they had these superiority air cover and everything, and uh, probably the German planes would have never gotten close to us <laughs> if they'd ever launched any to come over. Of course, they can launch the buzz bombs. They don't stop for anything. They just go where they want to go unless they get shot down or something. But uh, uh, the uh, otherwise, why it would have been pretty tough getting in there. I imagine to uh, to get through the air defense there. Did you guys sleep the night before? Did you have a last meal? What did you guys do that night before you took? <laughs> well, we uh, the last night. Well, we didn't have any big meal. We just had our rations, what we had with us, and. Uh, and then we had enough to go on our, uh, to last us a couple of days out in the field when we landed. And of course, we were prepared to land on the second wave. We were on LCIs, which is the Landing Craft Infantry. And so that's what we were loaded onto in, in uh, Weymouth. And that ship, of course, goes all the way across. Uh, however, uh, the night uh, we got the word that we were going to ship out. Why? Well, there wasn't too much excitement or anything like this. Everybody figured that uh, we weren't we were very concerned because we weren't the first wave, supposed to be the first wave, because 16th Infantry was the first wave. 18th Infantry Regiment was supposed to be second. And uh, so when we got out there in the water and uh, during the night, there were so many planes flying over. It was just unbelievable. Uh, and there were bombers and there were fighters and, and there were uh, uh, C-47s uh, pulling paratroopers, I mean, uh, pulling uh, gliders. And then, of course, the C-47s with the paratroopers in them and so forth. And I think C-54s and all that kind of stuff, whatever they used. And uh, at one time, we looked up in the sky, we figured we could see at least 800 planes at one time out there in the sky. I, did, I didn't ask you, but were, were you with the, you say you were with the 18th? 
That was with the 18th Infantry Regiment okay. 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 of the 1st Infantry Division. About what time in the morning do you think you started uh, going into, into shore? I mean, do you remember what time that was? Well, we started out during the night. Uh, I don't know what time we left or anything, but I know that uh, we were out there a long time because it's a long ways from Weymouth over there. It was about 100 miles, so you had to start early. And, um, and so I don't know exactly what time we left there, but uh, we were out on the water. And the first waves were landed somewhere about six something. And, uh, and we were out there just uh, probably a few, you know, like 18, 20 miles off the coast. And we could see what's going on from the air and the ships that are firing and all that kind of stuff. We could hear them firing and we could hear them, the bombs dropping and we could, uh, we could, we couldn't see anything because it was dark at first. And then, uh, then of course there was a lot of haze and so forth. So we couldn't see anything that far out, but we got closer and they suddenly came on to the speakers there and said that, uh, they wanted more troops on the beach immediately. They didn't want to wait. They didn't want the second wave in yet, mm. but they wanted more beat troops on the beach immediately. So, my squad and I, we were on the uh, headquarters LCI boat because our companies, each one company to a LCI is what it usually is, and uh, that if uh, you had any excess baggage, they put them somewhere else. Well, we happened to be the third squad of the third platoon, so we were put on the uh, headquarters boat. So when they wanted more troops, where well, our squad was elected to go off into a Higgins boat, and we uh, landed on the, we went in just like the first wave did, except that they were already on the beach pinned down. And uh, while we're uh, out there in the water, we saw, uh, when we got closer, you know, and getting close to the beach, after we, uh, we went over the side of the boat, uh, into the Higgins boat, the water was rough. I mean, it was the boat would be up here and down here and up and down. You had to get off just the right time. Uh, if you if you went too soon and you could uh, uh, get jarred pretty badly if you got too close to jump or <laughs> too far down to jump or something like that, or you might miss and get crushed between the boats. That's uh, that's how rough it was. So. Uh, <coughs> But we all got into the boat okay, and then, uh, <coughs> excuse me, we went out to the, we went out in, we started circling around, and they gathered up, a, I guess, a few more boats, and then we headed in towards the beach. And when we were coming in, we could see all these battleships firing, and all the, uh, we could hear the bombs dropping, uh, and that was still going on. and. We thought with all that firepower that there ought not be anybody on that beach, you know. It shouldn't, uh, uh, how could they be pinned down, you know. So when we, when we got there, we, were, we weren't quite sure what uh, we were going to find. But uh, we weren't prepared for the chaos that we came up on. While we were going in, we saw them coming in on Higgins' boats there. Some people were bailing out of, on them because uh, some of them had got been hit. And uh, we saw the ducks coming in with supplies. And uh, uh, they were, uh, some of them were swamped and sunk out there in the water. And there was a lot of incidents like that. Then when we got close to the beach, well, there was a few beach crafts that were already uh, grounded because of uh, hitting mines or being hit by artillery. And when we, uh, we were out quite a ways when we hit a sandbar and it was probably about 100 yards out and we hit the sandbar and, then, and we asked the guy, is this as far as we're going? And he said, it's as far as we can go. And so he put down the ramp out front. So we all ran out of it as so we ran out and we, on the other side of the sandbar, I ran into water. It was clear up to my neck. And you know, I mean, going into shore on that, you, you were on a Higgins boat. I mean, we were on a Higgins boat, right? So, I mean, 
what were you, what were your thoughts? I mean, going in. We were supposed to be a second wave, but we were yeah. joining the first wave. Right, but you, you as a young man. Well, I just figured they were sending us in as fodder. <laughs> be, you know, like uh, they needed they needed more targets. <laughs> Uh, no. Uh, what are you thinking about? Well, I I don't think we were concentrating on uh, being scared or anything. I think we were concentrating on more what we were going to do when we got there. Uh, and uh, yeah, the guys were scared, and and I was scared. Every, you know, if you're not scared in battle, why there's something wrong with you? Because when they're shooting bullets at you, you got a reason to be scared. And. Uh, you never know when one of those things is going to be your turn. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, the guys were scared, but uh, I was the only one in the out in the squad that had any combat experience before. Anyway, I had two previous landings, and so this one here, of course, was a heck of a lot different than any of the others because it was so more, much more intense, and so much bigger, and so many more people involved and everything, and. Uh, and the water was rougher than any other places we were. And everything was just overwhelming, you know, sort of like. And you just, uh, the, the, the most, uh, I always, you know, people ask me, well, weren't you afraid of dying? And I said, no, I was, I was uh, doing the best I could to live as long as I could. <laughs> and that's exactly what all of us were trying to do, you know. We didn't want to go there to die, but uh, if we did, well, that was part of our job. But otherwise, why? Well, uh, uh, there's no doubt, but what we were scared. And of course, if somebody gets it, well, you you feel awful lucky it wasn't you, you know, and uh, you feel lucky that it wasn't you. And uh, it's uh, unbelievable uh, a man's senses, you know, when. He's out there in combat, and, and he knows that he doesn't want his friends to get hit. But then, um, uh, if you get hit and and they don't, why, well, you, you know, <laughs> it's it's kind of a bad situation. But uh, on the other hand, if you don't get hit, it's kind of a good situation in in, in a way because uh, you're still going to you still got a chance, you know. So I always uh, tell everybody that uh, I was fighting to live and to to come home, you know, to win the war. That's all we were there for. And so we knew that this is what we had to do when we were landing. And most of the guys knew why they were fighting the war, though. They knew that they were fighting for God and country. And that, I think that was the biggest uh, help that we had, actually, because um, we knew what the Germans were doing before, uh, that the, they'd been burning Bibles and that they'd been sending kids to uh, German, uh, German schools and things like this and teaching them anything, uh, everything Nazism, but nothing about any of the rest of the world or the freedom of uh, the rest of the world or anything that they, uh, that they didn't have, you know. They, they didn't know anything about freedom. They had to do as they were told or get shot or killed or something like that. So uh, that's the kind of life they were living. And uh, we didn't want to live that kind of life. And we all knew that. And so we, feel, we felt that uh, you can't have freedom without God and a country and a country to live in. Uh, and, uh, and we felt sorry for the people who were living under those kind of circumstances that they didn't have any freedoms. Uh, it was just, uh, we, I don't think we really concentrated on that too much at that time. The older you get, the more you think about it, but uh, I can't tell you everything I think about. <laughs> well, well, you know, just as a young, I mean, in my mind, I wasn't there, obviously. And yeah. I sometimes wonder what it would have been like to have landed on Omaha Beach on a Higgins boat. I mean, well, you, get out, you get out into the water, and then what's going on? I mean, they're shooting at you. And uh, well, as close when we got close to there's always uh, there's always artillery shells coming out into the water, and there was always uh, uh, machine gun bullets and things like that flying around from different directions. You know, they had we were under a lot of crossfire, and uh, they had uh, 
they had a pill bo a pillbox over on the right, way down on the right, which was probably about three miles, but it had a coverage of clear across Omaha Beach. Then there was another one on the other side, the same direction away and cutting across this way. And then they had the pillboxes in between. And at the draw where we came in, there was a pillbox up on the hill and one down at the center of the draw, then one up on the hill from there. And, uh, that we were in direct fire all the time. And so, uh, you know, anybody getting across that beach was going to be very lucky. Um, so when we got there, of course, we, uh, when that ramp went down, we could, we'd get into the water and it's like over my sergeant's head. Uh, uh, we had to pull him in away so he'd get his head above water so he could carry himself in. And uh, when we got up on the shore, the first thing they wanted to do was to dig in. And I told him, we can't do that. We can't, it would be dead just like the rest of these guys laying around here. And, uh, and there was a beach master who was running back and forth and he was directing traffic up there. And I asked him, which way do we go from here? And he said, well, follow that path there. And he said, if you go to the right or left of it, you'll step on mines. And so that's what we did. We followed the path, but we ran out of path because uh, uh, the guys never made it all the way across the beach. There was one last row of wire that hadn't been blown yet. There were two Bangalore torpedo men up there who had blown the previous wire, but they were pinned down in a kind of a crevice that they were in. And uh, we asked them to blow the wire for us. They said, well, we can't. We're pinned down. And they said, well, we'll uh, fire up into the trenches while you uh, blow the wire for us. So we started laying down a field of fire up there. And there was only 12 of us, but we we were laying down a pretty good field because we had the automatic rifleman with us too. And uh, then they got up to move and put the torpedo under the wire. The uh, first guy that moved got killed and he got hit. I don't know where he got killed, but I think he got killed that day. But we didn't have time to check it out. Uh, the other guy got the torpedo under and then he blew it. And that's the last we saw of him. We never saw them again because we went on through the wire as soon as it was breached while we ran through the wire up and got up into the trenches with the Germans. Because we had to go up the hill about, probably about 25 yards before we could get into the trenches. Mm -hmm. But we ran all the way up in there. Well, tell me about that experience. I mean, getting up in the well, trenches and what Well, the, the thing was is that it was, uh, we were shooting our way up and we'd be firing as we go because we couldn't see the Germans. They were in these, uh, uh, trenches up there. They had trenches from one pillbox to the next down the ways down there. And that's how they went back and forth. You couldn't even see them moving up there. But they would uh, be shooting over, you know, the uh, embankment and at us on the beach. And through the grass and things like this, we couldn't see them, but they, they could see us. And so we had just had to fire in their general direction to keep them pinned down as much as possible. So we had to keep firing while we were going up there. And uh, we just uh, rushed on up and we got into the trenches with them. They started running from us. And but while we were, when we got into the trenches, we could see uh, a guy with a, my dog hitting the gate. <laughs> we could see the guy uh, carrying a pole charge up to the pillbox, trying to bit it in the breach of the pillbox. And, and uh, he got killed before he got there, but we noticed that there were two other guys that had been carrying pole charges that had gotten killed too before they got there. So no, no one got a pole charge into that pill box. Uh, we got behind a pill box and, and we captured it from the rear. And I don't think we could have captured it any other way except through the rear because uh, uh, they were such strong boxes and everything they would had uh, 10 feet of cement with rebar in front of them and the shell hit that. And of course, you know, that's already mounted into the ground there. So it's not going anywhere. It might pierce a ways, but uh, they use armor piercing on them. And, uh, and all they would do is knock a few little blocks of cement off and that's it. <laughs> uh, otherwise, they didn't, they didn't go through at all. The only way they could do any damage is to go through the breach if they could get you know, an accurate shot in or, an, or a lucky shot in to go through the breach. Uh, anyway, we got the 
captured four Germans and sent them back down. The rest of them we killed, and the rest of them fled. So uh, we went on fighting, and that's, uh, that was our first day of going across the beach. Well, back, back to the beach now. You mentioned that there were bodies all over. I mean, are you, are you prepared for this? Are you seeing this? Are you thinking? I mean, what we weren't we prepared for the chaos that we saw because there were so many of them. There were guys laying on the beach, and there were guys uh, huddled up against the wall that were on the right side of us. We didn't have a wall in front of us, but there, over on the right side there were some guys huddled up against the wall. And they didn't have any guns or anything. They, they'd lost them out in the water before they got on the beach. And a lot of them were wounded. And the, the guys laying on the beach, most of them were wounded very severely or dead. And uh, uh, it was just a, a horrible mess. It's something I didn't even want to look at. You know, I, when I went over there, I went, my brother and I were together. We were together from uh, when we joined the Army in uh, 1940. And we were together when we landed in uh, Africa with the 3rd Infantry Division. And then we got transferred to the 1st Infantry Division. And we were together rest, through the rest of Africa and through Sicily. He got wounded in Sicily and was medevaced back to Africa. And then we didn't see him until after the war was over in Sicily and we went on to England and then he rejoined us in England. And uh, he was with us then. And uh, actually he was in my mortar section then. And I was a mortar section leader then. And uh, uh, we uh, were called into the company commander's office one day in March of 44 and uh, he said that uh, it was three things he wanted to tell us about and one was that uh, we had to increase our GI insurance because this next invasion they expected we might have as much as 50 50 percent casualties or something and he thinks we should have the maximum amount of GI insurance which was then which then was ten thousand dollars and I, we, so we increased that. And then he said, that the second thing is that they had a Sullivan brother incident in the, in the Pacific where they lost five brothers, four or five brothers, I don't know, I think it was five. And uh, General Marshall passed out the word that brothers shouldn't be serving together in this kind of an assault or invade, you know, uh, together in a situation like this where like the both of them get killed at the same time or something like that. So anyway, uh, they separated us and they, they did. Uh, my brother stayed in the Company K and I was transferred to Company L. So that's all the further I went was just one company. And uh, so I was uh, given the third squad of the third platoon and then I became, of course I was a, s a staff sergeant then. And so I was training the guys in England before the invasion. And uh, the, uh, he, when the, he came in, uh, he came in on the second wave. The, you want to know that, the, well, you know that the first wave had 50% uh, casualties and the second wave had 30% casualties, but you know, casualties in the terms of the guys who are making the landings and so forth, uh, whether it was the second wave or the first wave, could be 100%. Because the guys who are making the landings are the guys who are the ones getting killed. All the people that are supporting us are out of gunshot range and things like this. So that, you know, they, they're used as uh, estimates of the number of people involved in the invasion, but uh, the number of people who got killed are the guys on the front line there. And so we had whole companies get wiped out. We had whole platoons get wiped out. And, uh, and uh, whole squads. And so, you know, uh, to the guy on the front line, that uh, could have been 100% casualties. Yeah. And uh, some of the companies was almost 100%. Of course, uh, the 16th Infantry suffered that. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Joe Dawson. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, his company got practically wiped out. He reorganized a bunch of stragglers and made up another company and 
kept on going in now. It was a marvelous thing that he did. I mean, he's a, a, a very good leader. Uh, anyway, that's what happened out on the beaches. And uh, I, I just, you know, the, the Saving Private Ryan showed a lot of blood and things in the water. I, I can't say that I saw a lot of blood like that, but uh, there could have been, but I doubt, you know, there's, there's a lot of water out there. There's six miles of beach and the water's flowing in and, and it'd take a heck of a lot of blood to make it show like they did in showing Private Ryan. Uh, that, uh, uh, I could see it happen in a creek or something like that where you got a little narrow stream or something, but it don't wash back out. It's, you can see it going down, but uh, in the ocean, it comes in, it goes back out, and it's recycled, <laughs> and it comes back in salt water again. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not as, maybe not as bloody as they showed it in Private Ryan, but uh, when you get up on the beach, you can see it. You can see where the, the guys are, have bled and things like this. And uh, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a bloody mess, and it was a horrible thing to see. Uh, but. Uh, did you see any right. medics or chaplains working during that day? I mean, were they doing anything with the dead and the wounded? Well, uh, there were so many people down there and so many people doing things like that. Some of them were chaplains and some weren't. And some, I mean, the, the people were uh, trying to uh, comfort other people and things that they'd, uh, and uh, medics, of course. And, and we didn't, uh, we didn't stay there long enough to observe too much about what's going on on the beach. We got across that beach, and I got all six, all 12 of my men across the beach and into the, a bit to the hedgerows before we ever lost a casualty, which was a miracle in itself because nobody on the beach is, can say they came across the beach without having a casualty uh, in a squad that, and, you know, that's 12 men or so. so. Uh, you got that big a squad, you're allowed to have allowed as much as 50% casualties, but we didn't have any. And uh, we were just lucky. We were just lucky. I figured that uh, God was showing us the way or something, or he was clearing the way for us. And maybe that's what was going on. But anyway, uh, we were very, we thank God every day for our lives because uh, it, was, uh, it was a miracle that we got off of that beach. When we looked back, we couldn't believe it. <coughs> we saw the second wave come in, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, we saw the ships get hit, and uh, like my brother's ship got hit, and he got killed on the second wave. So he got killed down on the beach, but I didn't know at the time that he got killed because all I saw was ships getting hit and things like this, and I didn't know which one he was on personally because uh, we never thought about taking numbers or anything like that. And, memorize about what boat you were on or anything like that because we didn't plan to be on them that long. <laughs> uh, so uh, when we got off, I, there was so, uh, there was no way of, for instance, uh, for me to go back and see if what happened to him or anything like this. I've had people ask me, well, why did you go look for your brother? Well, they weren't on the beach that day, or they didn't see how many people were on the beach that day. It'd be like trying to find a needle in a haystack, you know? And I wouldn't be doing my job if I was doing that. And my brother and I had a pact that we, would, we wouldn't be going around looking for one another when we should be out there fighting. And that's the way it was. And uh, that's the way it was with the, with the rest of the troops, so in our outfit. They all knew that they had the job to do, and. And if they hadn't kept on fighting, if they'd all, you know, stopped and busy around somebody else, so the first thing you know, they'd all get killed in a bunch or something like that. Yeah. So they had to keep on going, otherwise it wouldn't have been a successful landing. And so I, there were a lot of brave, there were a lot of brave men, a lot of brave heroes, and a lot of, uh, and the men that made the supreme sacrifice were all heroes as far as I'm concerned, very much a hero. Of course, my brother was my biggest hero because he was my hero from the very beginning. He was older than I by four years, and uh, he would always looked up to him. Always tried to beat him in wrestling and things like that. <laughs> so, 
Yeah, he was, he was a fantastic person. Where is he buried? Pardon? Where is he buried at? Well, uh, in 1948 or something like that, they brought him home mm -hmm. when they were removing bodies, I guess, to put in the uh, Colville Cemetery, yes. the American Cemetery. Uh, they, uh, all, they authorized the families to have their loved ones brought home if they so desired. And, and I, I, I didn't know it, but my brother had told my mother one time that he never wanted to be buried on foreign soil. Oh, is that right? And so uh, she had him brought, she wouldn't know, if, she asked me if it was all right to bring him home. And I said, that was her, if that was his wish, it was all right, fine with me. And, and, and regardless of whether it was his wish or not, if it's, that's what she wanted, that's what she should have. Sure. So she had him brought home and he's buried in our cemetery in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, it, was a, it was a sad day though, I'll tell you. Did you, you don't ever forget those things. And we, uh, we went on in to work on Inland and then, uh, I don't know how far you want me to go with this story. Wait, but I want you to tell me, you gotta tell me, you've probably told it many times, but tell me about the actions on June 9th or 10th that you took oh. that won you the Congressional okay, Medal. Well, Give me that story if you could. Well, actually, we uh, from the day that we landed, why we uh, stayed in combat, and we were in combat for the seventh uh, and the eighth, and on the night of the, uh, I think it was on the night of the, uh, I think it was on the night of the seventh that uh, we were in a perimeter out there, and we were in a holding position and a uh, German patrol had ran over our position and because uh, we had, uh, we were the third platoon, we were in a, in a hedgerow up there, we just joined our company and uh, that was on the night of the, on the evening of the 7th, you know, and then uh, in the night is when they came in, but uh, we were by a hedgerow there and the Germans had sent a patrol in and a, Apparently, uh, they didn't know where they were going either, uh, but they were carrying a briefcase, and and when they crossed, uh, the 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 perimeter people shot at them, but they couldn't shoot them once they got inside the perimeter because we'd have been all shooting one another. So uh, they let them go. They went on through, and then they wanted a squad to follow them. So a squad they wanted, you know, a patrol to follow them. So. I got picked for the job, so I went out and we were following them down this road, and it was dark. I mean, it was really dark, and in the hedgerows between the hedges, <clears throat> at night you can't see your hand in front of you. You can look up and see the clouds or something like that, but when you're looking in the hedgerow, it's dark. And uh, so we followed them, and then uh, we came up on this briefcase that one of them had dropped, and we picked it up, and we kept on going four ways, and. So I thought, well, you know, we've been out there about a mile or so, and I said, you know, we gotta, we're going to turn around and go back because uh, we don't know where we're going and what we're going to find if we get out here. We'd probably all get captured if we kept going. So I said, we'll drop, just... Drop your hand down. Okay. So uh, I said, we'll just, uh, we'll just take the uh, suitcase back and give it to the company commander. And so. When we got back, we took the suitcase and gave it to them, and they opened it up, and they saw some maps in there, and they took it down to headquarters. And these maps were second and third line of defense of the Germans' withdrawal from the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the next day, and uh, on the eighth, we were having a lot of, you know, field battles. Uh, and then we, on the ninth morning of the ninth, we started out again, and. We had a platoon in the field over on our left and our platoon on the side. And we were going uh, across the field and we uh, came up, uh, uh, well, they got fired upon on the field next to us. And as soon as they got fired upon, I knew that we didn't want to get caught out in the middle of this field, so I rushed my squad up to the hedgerow in front of us. And we didn't get fired on, but we could hear them still firing over there. So I went down the hedgerow and 
and then I started going up to where I heard this machine gun firing, and I, so I'm going up this hedgerow, and, I, and right below me was a German patrol, and they spotted me, and they had their guns pointed at me, and I spotted them, but then I shot all for them before they could shoot me. <laughs> and that's, uh, I wouldn't have been here if I hadn't done it. And uh, so um, uh, then I went on up the hedgerow, and I got on to the machine gun, and I knocked it out. And then uh, uh, that wasn't the end of it. Uh, after we knocked it out, there was, there was another machine gun up, uh, up the hedgerow, and the, our troops down here then had crossed over, and then they started getting fired from that one. And this one was firing from a corner up in the hedgerow, just like the other one was. And, but there wasn't anything back of its hedgerow. And uh, so we got up there, and uh, I knocked out the machine gun, and I had my, of course, when I, after I'd, I have to back up a bit. When I uh, knocked out the enemy patrol, uh, I'd fired so many rounds that I figured that I better reload. And I thought, uh, and I better fix bayonets too because we were too close to them. When you're out from here to the fireplace, there's a guy who's pointing guns at you. Why, if you shoot all your ammunition out of an M1, that's only eight rounds, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, you better have your bayonet ready f to use in case you need some help there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, f they all fixed their bayonets, and so we kept on going up. And so when I knocked the last machine gun nest out, one of the guys told me to bayonet the guy. said, as long as I got bullets, I'm not going to bayonet anybody. <laughs> and so uh, we did that, and I got up on the mound there, and I, there was two big mortar positions back there. And there's about 12 Germans there, and they saw me with my bayonet standing up there. And I had it at port arms, you know, and I, they, and their eyes got real big, and they stared at me, and they started to run. You know, their reaction was to get out of there, and I told them to halt, but they wouldn't halt, so I, we had to shoot them. And uh, the rest of the squad came up there and was helping me knock off the rest of the. Uh, a group there, and we, I think we even got them all, but uh, anyway, the, uh, 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 after we got through there, then we went on further, and there was one more machine gun nest that we got up in, the, up in another corner up there, and that was apparently one of their lines of defense there that we were just hitting, hitting them right on the head there, and uh, so we got that one. And the next day, why, uh, the company commander has us, has me and my squad to take the lead of the platoon, and uh, so we're going across this field. Only we decided not to go out in the middle of the field anymore. We'd go up along the hedgerows, mm -hmm. and so we were going up along the hedgerow, and we were just about up to the other field up there when we started getting fired upon from the right and from the left and from all in the front of us. So we had fire coming from three sides. Company commanders what sent up word, passed up word to tell Sergeant Healers to withdraw his squad from this position. So, and I looked around. I thought, wow, well, if we turn to go to Basco, we'll all get picked off. And so uh, I saw a mound there, and so I went up on this mound. And I said, "You guys, uh, the rest of you, withdraw here, and I'll go up here and." keep the enemy pinned down so that my automatic rifleman knew his job so he came up with me. So we're firing in a semicircle around on these hedgerows. We just pop, pop, pop all around this and they would be ducking down, you know, and, uh, and all the guys got back. Then he and I turned to come back and uh, I saw him put a machine gun down, down in the corner of the field there to my right hand corner. And uh, and there was three guys, and I was busy working on them. I was shooting that's probably about 100 yards or so, probably around 150, I don't know for sure. I think it was about that. Anyway, I was hitting them, and then I got hit in the back, and it spun me around. And I, when I got hit in the back, and it so it spun around, I saw a German standing up in the hedgerow there, and so I shot him, and he fell out. And then I saw my automatic rifle 
uh, I was I was I shot him when I was falling down, and then I got up and I saw my automatic rifleman standing there, and not standing but laying on on the ground there. And so I went up to see if I could help him, and uh, he was wounded in the right arm and the leg. So I got him up and got his arm around my neck and carried him back to the hedgerow behind me uh, to where the company was. And then uh, I went back and got the automatic rifle because I couldn't carry it the first time. So I guess that was the uh, reason. But I actually, one of my men got killed. That, that was the first time one of my men got killed, actually. He was at the head of the squad, uh, and uh, he got killed uh, up in the hedgerow there. And uh, his name was Eddie Sobrak, a nice guy. Yeah. Oh, I didn't ever tell you about the members of my squad. They, they were all musicians, uh -huh. not all of them, but a few of them were. Uh, Eddie Sobrak was a accordionist, and, and Basil Nelson was a uh, guitar player and a singer and another guy I think his name was Robert Eddings he was a, a played a fiddle <laughs> and uh, then we had another guy that was a boxer and so forth they used to go around and entertain when the troops in the uh, when we were stationed in England at the hospitals and so forth and when I got the squad why they never passed an inspection and we could never go on leave or anything so I told them that they had to pass inspection or nobody was going anywhere not even out to you know to entertain the troops so I got challenged to that but I finally got them squared up it was the first time they ever when we fell out for the next inspection why well, the first time our squad ever passed inspection <laughs> but the company commander said how'd that happen <laughs> so as but that, from that time on, they always they followed me wherever I went, and it was. And after I got into you know into France, when the first break we got, why well, I had guys coming and went to join my squad, but I didn't have any openings. <laughs> yeah. so, but, uh, I'm sure you've been asked this question, but I mean, you know, me as a civilian, never been in combat, but. I mean, what are you thinking about when you're shooting the enemy? I mean, are you thinking? I, I've had some men say they're a different person. Uh, they're the enemy. In other words, I, I, I talked to schools. I had a little third grader one time ask me, uh, how many people did you kill? And I said, well, honey, I didn't kill people. I wasn't trained to kill people. I was trained to kill the enemy. And the enemy was trained to kill me. And if I didn't kill him, I wouldn't be here talking to you because he would have killed me. And I said, you know, that's, that's the way it is in combat. You're trained to kill the enemy. You're not trained to go out and kill people. That's, a, that's not our purpose at all. We're trained to kill the enemy who's trying to uh, maybe defend his country or maybe uh, uh, fight aggression, uh, fight for aggression or fight for take over some other country or something like that. That's the enemy. He's coming after you. You've got to defend yourself. and. So uh, you're his enemy, but uh, he's also yours. So you, you, uh, you're not trained to kill the people, though. You're not trained to go out and massacre people or anything like that. And you're trained to actually kill the enemy. And uh, so I, I never felt bad about killing the enemy, but uh, I felt you know bad about you know killing a person. But on the other hand, I had to live with myself and I had to I had to justify it why I was fighting and I was fighting for God and country and I figured the enemy was fighting against it that's exactly what was happening so and, and as long as I can justify it right I used to I carried my rifle and I used to have my Bible with me and I had to, I used to read the 29th or the uh, Psalms and uh, the one verse there says that I ride and my staff shall comfort thee. And I said, this is my rod and my staff, and it's comforted me a lot of times, <laughs> the M1 rifle. So, uh, no, that's, uh, uh, I had to, uh, you had to uh, keep your mind off of, of uh, thinking about killing people. You're not killing people, you're only killing the enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you have to justify it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have won the war. Yeah. 
and uh, the I like the uh, you know I, I talk about atheists in foxholes, for instance, in Africa. I had a friend; his name was Pete, and we were uh, I, when we were in the third division, then, and we went up to um, in Fort Lewis, Washington. And I got him to go to church with me one morning, and. He said, well, I'll go to church with you, but I'm telling you, I'm an atheist and I don't, I don't go to church. And I said, well, I said, you can go to church with me one day. So he did. When he came out, he said, I'm still an atheist. <laughs> I said, well, that's the way you want to be. That's fine. So anyway, we're out there in Africa. This is a couple years later. Mm -hmm. And we're up there on the hill and we're being, a, and was, we're in the 1st Infantry Division then. We're up on the hill and we're digging in up on this hill and the Germans are firing artillery at us, and the, they were also coming down the valley with their tanks, and they were shooting at us, and these old bullets would be going off, and uh, tanks would be ricocheting the rocks around there and things. And Pete's up there, and he's just digging in, digging in, and he says, uh, oh, God, help me, oh, God, help me. I thought, wow, you know, Pete's asking for God's help. And, so it was all over why everything settled down. We got to, I got a chance to talk to him and I said, you know, Pete, you know, I said, uh, uh, I heard you asking for God's help when you were out there digging in. And, uh, and I said, why were you asking for God's help? He said, well, there was no one else to ask to help me. <laughs> I said, well, it worked, didn't it? We're still here. <laughs> so I know that was one of them. And another time, I <laughs> uh, the guy he's uh, he was in a foxhole. All of a sudden, he had the urge to move out of that foxhole to another one. And uh, he's and he got out of it. Why some mortar shells landed. One landed in the foxhole that he was in. I said, why did you get out of that soft soul? And he says, well, God told me to. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and he, he never, he never, uh, uh, he claimed, he didn't claim, he, he didn't claim to believe either in religion, but uh, he said, from now on, I believe. <laughs> because he says that, I just, just, uh, you know, some, some people say, a little birdie told me. He said, God told me. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's what he's, that's the nearest thing. He didn't hear any birds, so he figured God must have told him. <laughs> so. Do you remember any kind of prayer service before you landed on Omaha Beach? Do they have anything on the show? Uh, guys? Well, we said our own prayers, you know, and things like this. They, they did have chaplains and so forth, but uh, chaplains go around and press, you know, passed out Bibles to the guys that didn't have them. Always carried one all the time. In fact, I have a story about my Bible is that uh, the last time I got wounded, that was in 1945 up in Germany somewhere. And uh, I uh, uh, was, uh, had taken off my pack and I was medevaced out to the hospital in Paris. And, and then about, oh, in 1952, I think it was, my mother got this little package in the mail and, uh, and a letter from a German lady. Mm -hmm. And of course the package was my Bible and it had her name and address in it and my name just was on the bottom of it. And uh, she said that her children were digging under some rocks behind her house and they found this Bible. She says, uh, I, she says, I just thought I should return this to you because I'm sure that you would have wanted it because it looks like it had been used and also uh, that she didn't know whether I survived or not, but she says, I'm sure you would want this for a member of Vivian, but she said she hoped that I had. And uh, that was from a German lady. So it was kind of a, uh, a touching thing, you know, especially for my mother, you know, because she had lost a son, you know, and uh, so, but it just goes to show you that there's good people in every country, it's just that, uh, uh, it's the leaders who get us into trouble with one another, and uh, and the people, of course, got to defend our 
country and our rights and so forth and our liberties. Uh, and sometimes we have to take up arms. But uh, other than that, there's not really any good reason for going out and fighting one another. We should be able to talk all these things out. We shouldn't be doing like the Irish are doing because they're both religious. They're fighting one another. But it's hate, that four-letter word hate, H-A-T-E. And my mother had told me when I was a kid uh, that uh, hate would, if, you know, I, I, one time I think I told her, I said I hated my sister or something like that. And of course, I had three sisters. <laughs> and uh, they were kind of, we were having a little tiff or something, and I told, I told one of my haters, my mother said, you don't hate anybody. And she said, I hear you ever say that again, I'll wash your mouth out with soap. She says, hate will destroy you, it'll destroy, it destroys people, it destroys countries. And she was right. When I look back over the things that's been going on in the last few years, hate is the biggest thing that's going on over in Iraqi, in Iraq and in uh, Afghanistan. Those tribes, those people, they, they hate one another because they fight one another all the time. And they've been fighting wars over there ever since Christ was born. Let me ask you a question about that German patrol. In my mind, you said you shot those four guys before they got you. I mean, did you get the element of surprise? How, how was that possible? I mean, or did they just were bad shots? Did they shoot at you, or what happened there? Well, I was the element of surprise because they didn't expect to see a person up on the hedge row. <laughs> and uh, they, were, they had the guns pointed at me, but I wasn't going to, you know, I couldn't tell them to halt. I couldn't. I had to shoot them. Mm -hmm. I had no choice because they were on the move, you know, yeah. and they were pointing at the guns at me. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't shot them, I, I'd have been a dead hero, <laughs> a dead soldier. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you now. Looking back, sixty years, Walt, on D Day, and you know just what happened on that day. T tell me your thoughts about it. Looking back now, in light of maybe. 60 years ago, the sacrifices that were made and the freedoms we have in our country today. What are your thoughts about D-Day 60 years later? Uh, D-Day is one of the most uh, is one of the days that we should honor the most in our history uh, during this uh, millennium because D-Day has changed the world. The things that happened on D-Day is that uh, when we went to war with uh, Japan and Germany and Italy and so forth, we went to war fighting Nazism, Fascism, Imperialism, and they're all three gone, and they're all three you know, a democracy now. And we were also involved in the Cold War with the communism. And of course, Patton had, had his way. We did fought communism from the very beginning. <laughs> but uh, he didn't have his way. But uh, because they were our allies at that time. But, uh, uh, and we were given the benefit of the doubt. But they showed their doubt when they took over the countries. When they came in, then they became the conquerors. Now, Germany was divided. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, all those countries were under Russian control. Mm -hmm. And they didn't give it up. And, they were, and those people were, they couldn't even get ahead. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't rebuild after the war, anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened until the Berlin Wall came down. And there is uh, another advancement of freedom. And all those countries now are free again. And it's, it's amazing. It is. it is. It's really amazing. And what have we been doing? We're still fighting for freedom. We're fighting for freedom of Iraq. We fight for the freedom of people who are being oppressed by, uh, you know, dictators and uh, evil leaders and so forth that uh, try to take away the rights of people and they go out and they slam by the thousands. That's just, it's, it's unheard of. Russia killed more people than Germans did. Yeah. And, and it's just, uh, it's, we're lucky we didn't have to go to war with the Russians. We're really lucky. Uh, they, could have, they could have been very justified, actually. As far as the people there were concerned, yeah. it could have been. 
but uh, people don't seem to think about that when their own cells are being protected. We got everything we want here. Right. We got we uh, constitution. Our constitutional government uh, is uh, formed on the basis of one nation under God, and uh, and that's the way it should be. And. The, we formed a nation, we spoke the English language, and when the people came here, they had to learn to speak English. Very vivid in my memory. I can still see the beaches as I approached them. I can see, still see the smoke and still hear the bombs going off. I can still see all the ships firing. I can see all the rockets going inland. I, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, when I'm coming into this beach, there shouldn't be anybody there. But when I get there, I, well, I just wasn't prepared for the chaos that I found on the beach on D-Day. All of the destroyed vehicles and all of the men uh, that were lying around there, killed and wounded, and all of the, just uh, the general chaos. Men didn't know which unit was theirs. I came up between the uh, 16th and the 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division. And the 16, someone said, come on, let's go, come 16, let's go. And someone over here come, said, come 16, let's go. And someone says, which 16? They didn't know, they know which uh, regiment they wanted to move out. And uh, so that, you know, that was, that's kind of chaos. And, uh, and, to see all that, uh, yes, it was uh, it was mind-boggling that anything like that could have happened. And it was, you see, there was no bombs dropped on our beach. There were no shell holes on our beach. There were no craters to get into or anything. That beach was just wide open with mines and obstacles and things like this, and guns pointed across it, and everybody when they came in had to go through that in order to conquer that beach and that day. And if they hadn't have, we might have been speaking a different language today. <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I still think it was the greatest success that the United States and our allies ever has done for the world is to uh, give it a lot more freedom than they've ever had before. A lot more people have a lot more freedom. A lot more people have more freedom now. They see all of these countries put together outnumber the United States, see. And so there's a lot more free people out there in the world today than there is in the United States right now, see. What was it like to meet Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks is a wonderful person. He's, uh, he is, uh, He's not only an actor, but he's a real person. He, he can do, he can act well, but he is also a real person and he is very natural with his acting. Now you met him personally? Yes, yes. Well, I had dinner with him, you know. Yeah. How about <laughs> but Spielberg, the, same thing? Spielberg, well, Spielberg, I don't know uh, quite. Yeah, Spielberg's very nice. I've met him and had, we had dinner with him too, so uh, he's, a man, he's a real nice person. And uh, I think they all are uh, uh, very good people. And it's, they've been making some pretty good films. You know. Tom Brokaw was the Well, Tom Brokaw's a reporter. He's a nice guy, though. Tom Brokaw, you know, wrote the, gener the Greatest Generation. Did any of them ever tell you to call him sometime or to stay in touch or? My men call me. No, Tom Hanks or Spielberg or Tom Brokaw, did they, did they tell you to stay in touch with them at all or anything like that? Or, or well, they never did say, they never said not they, to. Yeah. <laughs> but we have our pictures taken with Tom Hanks yeah. and, and uh, we'd had it taken with Tom Brokaw, but uh, he had, because of uh, Reagan's death, he was called out of the dinner thing. He had to leave early. But. Uh, it was, a, it was such a pleasure being there with them, though. They, they were just fantastic. I, I, find, uh, I find that in the, I, you know, I, I'm not rich and I don't have a lot of money or anything, but uh, I do have a lot of access to a lot of great people. 
<laughs> and, and the thing about it is that I find that these people who, uh, a lot of them who are rich are really wonderful people. And a lot of these people who are reporters and who are uh, actors and so forth are wonderful people. And, and uh, it's the uh, kind of publicity, the, it's the publicity that uh, tries to tear people down. I don't, it, was, it seems like it sells more papers. And that's, that's the bad part about it. But, uh, but the people themselves, most of them are really, really wonderful that I meet. And uh, I've met a lot of them. By the way, I have the Victor Award. Did you know that? No, no. You know what that is? No. You mind if I get it and show it to you? No, we're done. I want to see it. But...